From beautiful color displays like this to brilliantly colored fabrics in the garden, we'll have you craving color. The show starts in 30 seconds. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, if you're like me and you crave color, this is the show for you. You see, we're going to talk about using color in lots of different areas, like this space. You can see we've already rolled out the green carpet here. We'll visit with a turf expert. So why don't we get started with a construction update? Come on. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to finally have these steps coming out of the kitchen down to this pad. And just take a look at the pad. Isn't that looking great? What we're doing here is we're putting down some clay pavers in the basket weave pattern. Now this pad is six and a half feet by six and a half feet square, but it's on a very slight slope from, from one end to the other, only a half inch fall, and that's to shed the water. So if you think about in the winter, you get rain, you get sleet, it freezes, you wanna make sure that that slides right off and doesn't cause a safety hazard here. Now, what's great about this is that it's one of the elements that we've used around the house. We've limited the masonry to four different elements. We have the stone foundation, which is made from local stone, and then we have that cut stone above the windows and below the windows for the lintels and sills. And then we have the brick itself on the house, which is a red 17th century uh, wood molded brick that has been painted with lime wash. And then here we have these clay pavers. And I love the color of these because they blend so well with the garden, much better than a, a red paver would in this particular location. And these pavers have been tumbled. You can see the edges have been broken off just a bit. And this gives them an old look, which fits in with what we're trying to create here. You know, I receive a lot of questions about how I grow wildflowers. The main thing you have to do is get the right mix for your region of the country. And what we have here is a beautiful mix of wildflowers that is perfectly suited for my zone eight garden. You can see rudbeckias, you can see blanket flower, you can see the little fleabane daisy. All of those are peppered throughout this entire part of this meadow. Now, what you wanna do once you get the right selection of seed down is you wanna make sure that there is a seed bed prepared. It's critical that you get good seed to soil contact. Now you need to remember that some of these wildflowers are annuals and some are perennials. The annuals will bloom first year. The perennials often it takes two years as well as the biennials before you see some color. Now what I like to do is mix them so that in the first year I get plenty of annual bloom and in the second year as you can see with these gorgeous rudbeckias which are perennials they come on next. The first year they create a rosette and then in the second year they come up and they flower. Now the other thing I'd like for you to keep in mind if you're gonna try some wildflowers is that you want to wait until you mow and that's what I'm doing today. You see I have this long path that really creates a beautiful vista or alley from the porch down all the way to the river. And I keep that mowed throughout the season at about three inches high. It's important during the summer because the higher grass shades it and therefore this grass looks better throughout the heat of summer. Now, as far as my wildflower meadow, I will wait for all of those seed to mature and then I'll come in and mow that. Now, I wanna speak back to the spring for just a moment because we have different waves of them that come through. We had the early spring bloomers, which included those gorgeous cornflowers and blue and pink and white. And then we had larkspur in the same color range, blues, purples, pinks, and whites, and then poppies, poppies galore. Now, one of the things I like to do is gather wildflowers from time to time and just put them in a big basket. They make a beautiful bouquet. <laughs> You 
know, it's just amazing what a bit of lawn will do. The color green will change from this rather spotty color, because it was just laid, to an emerald green carpet. It'll be very beautiful and the perfect foil to so many of the plants growing around here at the Garden Home Retreat. Now, what's interesting about this grass is that in three mowings, after the third mowing, this little seam that you see between the pieces of sod will knit together. This patch of grass went down very quickly. We had the soil prepared. We wanted to make sure that it drained properly. And then the sod went down. We rolled it and now I've fertilized it with an organic fertilizer. Now, what's fun about this is that we have a rainwater harvesting system, if you will, off the house in these two buildings, which take water from the roof when it rains into a 6,000 gallon tank, which is under this lawn. So we'll be able to use that water, to not only irrigate this lawn, but other pieces of lawn on the property, as well as the orchard and the garden. Now, if you've never visited a turf farm, it's really amazing, particularly if you're into the color green because they're just acres and acres of pristine lawn. Roger Gravis is a turf expert. If you want the best looking yard in your neighborhood, nothing beats high quality sod to establish a beautiful lawn. But there are a few things you need to do to maximize your investment in that sod because it's somewhat expensive. Uh, the first thing, that you want to do is take a soil test and then you deliver that to the county agent and they analyze it. It doesn't cost anything and they will give you recommendations as to the amenities you need to add to your soil so your grass will grow properly. And then secondly, you really need a good irrigation system. That's very important, but your irrigation system is not going to do a whole lot of good unless you have good drainage. If your lawn does not drain well, nothing's going to grow very well. You can call your county agent and ask him what does well in your area. He's non-biased, he's not selling anything, and he'll give you some ideas. He'll tell you some varieties that work, and I'd recommend that you go look at some of those varieties and find some people's lawns that have that variety and have turf that's been there for two or three years. If it were me, I'd like to go after a rain and, and look at it and see what kind of weed problems they've got because sometimes they're not going to have time to do a lot of mowing. If the sod is mowed very close, it could have weeds in it and you wouldn't see them. As I mentioned before, you do your soil test first. Make sure your irrigation system is in and working properly. I mean triple tested. Your drainage should be in place. Don't get ahead of yourself. Plan it, buy your sod last, install it properly, water it, and enjoy your beautiful lawn. You know, I'm prone to get the cart way before the horse, and I'm afraid that's what's happening here just a bit. You see, this is the sleeping porch, and while we're still in construction, I thought that I'd go ahead and bring some single beds out here just to get an idea of what it's gonna look like. The beds came in. I know we did drawings and layouts and so forth for this space, but I thought, hey, what the heck, let's try them and see how they look. Now, you may be saying, Alan, you're crazy to be putting beds out here with this fabric. But you know, what we're using is an outdoor fabric. This is one of those transition spaces between inside and out. It's a porch. I decided to put these fabrics to the test and had a rambunctious four-year-old jump on the fabric with dirty feet. I also handed over some markers and let him generate a little artwork. And after all of his hard work, he relaxed with a popsicle. Now, after cleaning the fabric, there were no stains at all. Recently, I had an opportunity to visit with a textile designer who visited the Garden Home Retreat, and he assured me that even though these fabrics are used inside and out, well, the inspiration comes directly from nature. Fabric expert Greg Vuris is in the garden to tell us more. Many of us use flowers to bring inside the home to decorate. Well, today we're gonna to bring some fabrics outside to decorate with our flowers. You see here, with the blues and purples that coordinate really well with the greens and the purples of the Vitek. Now we move into summer where we're gonna use more warm colors like yellows, oranges, reds. Now we're gonna move into autumn where we have more colors of nature that complement the leaves and the foliage where we're gonna use burgundies, deep browns, and rusty oranges. And then in winter, we're gonna to move to more beige tones and browns 
and bring more textured fabrics inside using chenilles and boucles to give us more of a warm feeling. This is the fountain garden out here at the Garden Home Retreat. And I like to think of it from a color standpoint, really as a, a sort of a sorbet course, a palette cleanser between the warm side, which moves to the west, and the cool side, which moves to the east from this central point. In this garden, I concentrate on lots of neutral colors like white and gray. Now, this time of year, this space is particularly magical because you have several things blooming together. For instance, look at this vitex behind me. This variety is called Shoal Creek, and it is really putting on quite a show. And then just below it, you can see this perennial called Artemisia poas castle. It's one of my favorites, and it has a great aroma when you rub the leaf. And over here to my left, which is truly a showstopper, is the lily of the Nile, or agapanthus. I grow it in containers and bring it out in the summer because it can't take the cold winters here. Now, if you take a look at the circle, I've got pots of supertunias, the white ones that are spilling out of the containers, but I have to tell you, if you could have seen these pots back in the spring with the tulips, well, you just wouldn't believe it. These were filled with marine tulips. I put about 75 to 80 bulbs per pot and it was a knockout. So in the spring, we have the tulips, and then I replace them with these fabulous supertunias that will bloom right up until frost. Now, just behind the Artemisia, underneath these Vitex, I have three types of old-fashioned roses, which all bloom white, and then just under them, I plant the annual fan flower, Scavola New Wonder. So as you can see, this color theme is a very cool and soothing theme for the hottest days of summer. A vigorous clump farming plant featuring lemony lime foliage and pink flowers, its common name is coral bells, but I will tell you it will attract hummingbirds when it's in bloom. I recently visited California where I met up with John Rader to discuss key lime pie. John, you know, the idea of foliage is so important in the garden. And you take something like this heuchera, which I love heucheras. You don't really give up a lot to embrace a plant with this level of intensity of color. You don't have to have blooms, in other words. Yeah, you know, uh, it, often we, we are concerned when plant, when's the plant gonna bloom? When I'm gonna have color? Well, this one takes care of that for us. And this one gives us this beautiful chartreuse foliage that isn't, just entirely chartreuse, you've got some blendings of different shades of chartreuse. And so it's a great plant, it has nice texture to it because of the way that the leaves are, are multiple lobed like that. And right now, being the spring, we're getting the bonus of it's going to have yeah, some flowers on it. Yeah, you get those tiny little, little bells where it gets its name coral bell. Yes. And look at it with this blue scavola. Chartreuse is one of those I consider it a neutral, albeit an electrifying neutral. It works with so many other colors. It works with orange, it works with purple, uh, it works certainly with white. It's, it's a very versatile shade, and I think uh, speaking of shade, that it also was great as a shade plant because shade places often are sort of dull, yeah. and this kind of illuminates that. Yeah, you know, this is in your garden, uh, which is in full sun, but for most gardeners, they would give it a little shade from the afternoon sun. Yeah, I think that, that would be best to have it uh, shaded from the afternoon sun, morning sun, afternoon shade. We cheat a little bit here in the, uh, in the garden, right? And also, it's the time of the year also. We've, the angle of the sun isn't quite as high, yeah, so we can yeah. get away with it being out here in the full sun. Yeah, well, this is an excellent plant for the container as well. I have used it in numerous situations as the foliage plant. In, in containers, and recently I planted it in um, jars that have a beautiful turquoise glaze on them. And the juxtaposition of that turquoise green and this chartreuse green is just really dynamite. Yeah, it's a great plant for combinations. And what's nice in using it as a container plant is that many people don't think, well, planting perennials with annuals. Yeah, it's just yeah. fine to do that. Sure. There's no rules Mix it against up. that, you know? <laughs> Mix and it up. Well, and when we think about nature, you go into a meadow and uh, you see yep. perennials and annuals yeah. and grasses all growing together. Why not reproduce that in your own combination? It makes it more exciting. Yes, yeah. yes it does. Very good.
The Wildwood Botanical Garden is a great place to visit any time of the year. Tom Bruce tells us a little more about the place. Wildwood Park is one of the uh, unique botanical gardens, if you will, anywhere in the south. It is so typical of the Ouachita Mountain Range uh, and is the closest one into the city of Little Rock. It has about 100 acres, a little more than that, and it's divided into several gardens in about 20 acres that are developed. Of the gardens, the north side is very shady with lots of ferns and some very nice oak leaf hydrangeas that are glorious and form a huge white bouquet. At the end of the Butler Arboretum is the Gazebo Garden, uh, named for one of our patrons, uh, this uh, wonderful stone gazebo that is the picturesque piece of what Wildwood is to many of our visitors. And finally, the other major garden is the Hunter Wildflower Glen. Interestingly, some years ago, the artistic director of the, of the Wildwood Theater cleared out an area south of the theater for children to play. Uh, and she knocked down some trees and graded it all. Suddenly, the sun began to hit the soil, and a riot of wildflowers sprang up so that now we don't allow children to go into that area because it's so wonderful for everybody else. I want to show you what's just hatched in the incubator. Just look at this beautiful little gosling. <laughs> just a few hours old. This is a Sebastopol, which is that breed of geese we have here at the Garden Home Retreat with the curly feathers. As adults, their feathers have a little twist to them so that it looks like the entire bird. It looks like a feather pillow. And this little guy, well, you can't really tell he's going to have that kind of hairdo, or I should say feather do, but eventually, as he matures, he certainly will. But what a beautiful little baby. Now when these little guys hatch, what we do is we give them a water supplement. And by the way, these little guys don't need any feed or water for up to 48 hours after they hatch. There's enough yolk still left in them that that's enough energy and food supply for them until they begin feeding. But when we do begin to give them something to drink, I like to give them a vitamin supplement. And then what we do is we start them on a feed that is 20% protein. You can see he's already going after it. Look at that. Instinct at work. Now, what's amazing is once they start eating this feed, and by the way, I add a little brewer's yeast to this for goslings and ducklings because it gives them a little more niacin, and they need that. But anyway, once this little guy starts eating like this, you can't imagine how they expand in just four weeks. They start going through that very awkward stage where they're beginning to lose their down and put on feathers and then by six months, they look like they're full grown. We enjoy having geese out here at the Garden Home Retreat, particularly these rare Sebastopols, because we're providing an opportunity for their genetics to be perpetuated, and also they're very beautiful to have out in the pasture and on the pond. Welcome to my studio. This is the part of the show where I take photographs you send in and we take a look at ways to improve the landscape. Today, we've got a very interesting property in Illinois. Now, Pam, who submitted the photograph, said that she'd like some help with creating curb appeal with this house. By the way, you can see it's a really beautiful log house. Looks like new construction. And she wanted some help with balance. So why don't we get started? Now, one of the things that I first noticed about this is the lack of evergreens. Obviously this is in the winter and I think that having some evergreen foliage would really help. Um, and I certainly know that you do well with spruce there in Illinois. And Pam, I'm kind of wondering if to create balance, if we came in here and sort of framed the house with some spruce, maybe some Norway spruce. I love their sort of lofty limbs, the dark green. And then it looks like over here, we could even add a couple down in this lower part to help sort of frame the property. It looks like you've got quite a bit of, of land here. Uh, now be careful with spruce. You don't want to plant them too close to the house. That's a common mistake. But with plenty of room here, you can see how these would frame this house. 
Now, another thing I might do is, this looks like a front porch. You said that it faces east. Lovely place to sit in the summer, so you're not having the sun shine right in your face in the afternoon. What I might do is think about this tree. It looks like it may be blocking the view, and I wonder about this tree. Uh, the idea of maybe having a view from the porch where we might create a bed that would wrap around here, and maybe that is planted with a U hedge with a break in it. And this U hedge would be an evergreen that could sweep around, and on the back side of it, Pam, you could do a mixture of perennials. Now let me say this, the yews and the spruce are certainly deer resistant. You have a rural property, it looks like you may have problems with deer. So let's think about plants that would be not attractive to the deer population. Now what I'd like to see you do is behind here, Pam, put in the perennial bed where you can enjoy from the view from the house looking out some summer color. There, if you go with plants, a lot of the gray leaf plants deer don't like, such as catnip has a beautiful lavender flower, lavender itself, lamb's ear, all of these are really great perennial plants. Now, the other thing you could add would be daylilies. Deer do like daylilies, but you could also add some of the old fashioned favorites like peonies. They're not particularly attracted to peonies. But anyway, you get the idea. What we're trying to create here is that charm factor, that curb of peel you're looking for. Now, it looks like you could have an entrance here and perhaps we do a rustic gate that would go along with the style of the house. And maybe we repeat that rustic gate here. I could even see a pair of stone piers with a gate on it just made out of rough timber that will go with the log cabin motif. And the thing that I think you want to add for summer would be a lot of big blooms. This is a big space. You might do a big bank running along this side of the drive. It's a little hard to see how much room you have of hydrangeas. I love limelight hydrangea, and late in the summer, they are fantastic. In addition to that, think bold, Pam. You wanna make sure that these grasses, you've got some here, you've got some here, you've got a little bit there. Think about grouping these things and use them in big, broad brush strokes, just like I did here with this big bank of hydrangea that might run across here. Do your grasses in one big drift where you're using maybe 10 to 15 plants at a time. You make really strong visual impact that way. Hope these suggestions are helpful to you. Good luck with your project. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And I hope in some small way it's satisfied your cravings for color. And as I look around here and I see all these seed pods from these wildflowers, this area promises to be full of bounteous bloom next year. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.